It's a beautiful spring here in Alexander Valley. It's looking like it's going to rain, which uh, which is which should rain overnight, which is definitely welcome. One of the things that I uh, realized going through all this, um, kind of getting together some information for this, is um, is you know, and I think I put it in my notes that I'm going to be talking about later today, but it, it seems like. We're, we're in a very long cycle drought that's lasted since uh, about 1975. <clears throat> oh, also I thought I should probably take this opportunity to, uh, to show everybody this new set of Allen wrenches that I got. Uh, they look brand new, you'll notice. This is that they're actually used. Um, but good is new. And uh, they come in this very durable and yet attractive blue plastic case, standard on this side and metric on this side with a nice piece of contoured foam to keep them secure. Um, another one of my uh, recent purchases, and this is a, obviously <clears throat> a little bit of an indulgence, is this a uh, little uh, single mantle propane lantern that screws onto the top of uh, a standard 16.4 ounce propane canister. I think that's all I've got for props. So some, some folks are letting us know that they, they can't see video. It, it appears to be working on, on our end. Can, can anyone let us know if they see the, the video? Can you just pop? Okay, so Laura and Andy, you guys can see. John, okay, great. Laura and Andy, hi. Sean, Welcome you can see. see Will, okay. We miss you out here. <clears throat> For those of you that can't see the video, um, perhaps try the view function in the top right corner. Let us know if you if you continue to have issues. What's the weather like in New York, Andy? So people are joining from all over Pennsylvania, Vermont. Andy says it's cold and windy. Hmm. I lived in New York. I moved to New York when I was 19 years old to New York City. I've got I got family from New York and I moved out there when I was 19 years old and I had never lived in weather that was cold like that. And uh, I got a job working the door of a club and my shift was from 7 p.m. to uh, sometimes two. On weeknights, I worked from 7, to, to, uh, 7 p.m. to 2 a.m. And on weekends, I worked from uh, 7 p.m. to 4 a.m. And it was a his an historically cold winter. It was actually, it was the same year that my folks, later that year, um, my folks bought the Pyramid Vineyard. So I moved there in, in 95 and that was the year that my folks bought the Pyramid Ranch. And then I came back the next year and we started, we started developing it, but it was astonishingly cold. Um, I used to get, they gave us all shift drinks, even though I wasn't old enough to drink, but they gave us all shift drinks and, uh, because I had to stay up all night, I usually drank like uh, whiskey and Coke. And I remember that it got cold enough that the, the club was up the stairs and I would stand at the bottom of the stairs and I would put my, uh, my whiskey and Coke on the step and it got cold enough that it would freeze my whiskey and Coke. Not solid, but um, a little sheet of ice would form on the top of the glass. All right, <clears throat> so we're going to get started now. I hope you all have uh, have figured out how to get the video up. And if you haven't, please just go ahead and let Susanna or Natalie know. They're both here um, making sure that uh, that I stay between the lines and making sure that uh, that things work on a, at the technical end. And I just want to start by saying thank you to all of you 
both for being here tonight and for your support over this uh, over this past year and change. I um, it has made me more grateful uh, than ever to go through this really difficult time and have the support of of our wine club and our fans out there. It's a really it's a blessing to be able to do this for a living, and it's and it wouldn't have been possible to get this business going to begin with and to keep it going through these really difficult times without the help of folks like you. So thank you very much. Uh, the three wines that we're gonna taste today are obviously um, all Pyramid Cabernet. It's a 10, a 13, and a 16. And um, open the wines at any time. I am gonna start the tasting by actually opening the wines, but uh, please don't wait until we talk about the individual vintages uh, to start drinking, please drink throughout. I hope it will make it easier to uh, to watch me in and listen to me as we go along. Um, now, if you've got questions, you can type them into the uh, the Q and A box in Zoom, and I'll do my best to answer them live. And whatever whatever questions I don't get to, um, or that are just simple and easy to to field, Natalie or Susanna will get back to you over the course of the tasting and um, yeah, so I'll do my best to answer the, the questions as we go. And then at the end, we'll have a more extended question and answer period. And uh, I'll do the, my best to get to everything then. So let's get the wines open. Now, I thought that a lot, there were a lot of questions in advance. I asked you all to send me questions in advance. And one of the questions that everybody asked was, or a lot of people asked was, um, should I open the wines in advance and let them breathe? And should I decant them? And I want to say that as a general rule, I am not a fan of decanting wines and especially old wines. Um, and the reason for that is that while Cabernet is a really robust varietal, um, and really powerful and often really tannic. As these wines get older, um, I've really noticed that they become more delicate and that a lot of times, not with wines of the age that we're drinking, but let's say when these wines get to 20 years or if you're drinking a wine that's that old, a 20 year old wine, a lot of those aromatics are kind of fleeting and ephemeral and they change really a lot and sometimes really quickly. One of the best experiences I ever had drinking California Cabernet was um, a Lale family, Cuvée Daniel, and my friend bought it and brought it over. I'd never heard of it. And we were going to, to grill steak and, uh, and drink the Cuvée Daniel. And we opened it and each poured a glass of it. And it was really delicious. It was a 2000. Um, and that, this was a while ago. So it was comparable in age to like, let's say the 2010 now. And um, by the time we cooked the steak, um, the, the, best, the, the best of the wine uh, was behind us. Um, a lot of the, the really amazing and beautiful aromatics that it had when we started had blown off. So yes, sometimes wine takes a long time to open up. Sometimes it benefits from, from being open for a while, but the problem is you never know what you're missing if you're not there to, to uh, check it out. So my favorite thing to do is open the wine and pour a little bit in the glass and smell it right away and monitor as it opens. And another thing I'll say is that in order for the wine to do what we, what we call open, it needs exposure to oxygen. And when you pull the cork out of a bottle of wine um, and you don't take any of the wine out, it has very little surface area in contact with the air, just this little tiny bit up here in the neck. And that doesn't give it very much chance to breathe anyway. So if your goal is to let wine breathe, and I found that the 2013 really, in particular in this lineup, really benefited from uh, being open for a while. If you want the wine to breathe, the best thing you can possibly do is pour a little bit in the glass. So, I'm going to pour some of these wines now. I'm going to keep the 2010 on my left, just to keep track of things. But yeah, just pouring a glass or half a glass gives you more surface area on the top of the bottle. And the wine that you, and it aerates the wine as you pour it into the glass. 
And if what you want it to do is open up, you'll find that it'll do that, it'll do that a lot better with the help of the glass. One more thing, and this is this seems timely for me to talk about. When you're opening an old bottle of wine, oftentimes it's tricky to do because maybe the cork has deteriorated a little bit. And so I want to just share a couple of tips about how to do that. When you put the corkscrew into, a, into an older cork and you're worried about the integrity of it, take your time and be slow. Get the corkscrew all the way into the cork. And as you're pulling it out, make sure that you feel the cork give and separate from the edge of the bottle. What old corks want to do besides crumble is stick to the edge of the bottle. So make sure that the cork is actually coming out. If you feel the screw slipping, take it out and put it in and get another bite and make sure that you feel the cork drawing loose as you go. Laura was opening a bottle, of, an old bottle of wine for us to try last night and she pulled the screw through the middle of the cork. And after that, it was very, very difficult to get the cork out. So I won't get into the dangerous tricks of sticking pocket knives and broken corks to get them out because, uh, I, yeah, but uh, just be slow, be patient, and uh, make sure you actually feel the cork coming out at the same time that you pull the screw out. All right. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk also just a little bit about how I taste wine. So you only have one chance to taste wine with a fresh palate. And um, I, I mean, obviously, to some extent, tasting wine is what I do for a living. And I, when I'm lining up wines to taste them, the first thing I do is use my fresh palate on all the wines if it's possible for me to do that. So rather than, for example, tasting the 2010 and spending a lot of time with it, I'll smell all of the wines and then taste each of them briefly. Right now, unless you're Frank Simmons and you've been drinking since lunch, uh, your palate is as fresh as it can get. Use that as an opportunity to assess these wines before, uh, before you get any sort of palate fatigue at all. And for me, palate fatigue starts with the first sip. That might sound crazy, but when you're looking for tiny nuances in the wine, every little advantage helps. So as I say, I like to pull the corks, I like to smell them all, and then I like to take a tiny taste of each. Doesn't matter the order that you do it in. I'm gonna taste the 10 through the 16, um, but yeah. Actually, that 2015 is tasting delicious. It may just be where my palate is. That's another thing. Um, I, when I was tasting these wines last, well, not last night, but yesterday, and making some notes for the tasting today, I was thinking that, wow, the 2013 is incredibly grippy. And um, I'll just say that one of the things that I love about drinking wine is that the wine itself captures a place and a time. But also, our experience of the wine is so shaped by where we are emotionally and psychologically and where we are physically at the time that we taste it. So I agonize about these wines the whole time they're in the barrel and, um, and eventually uh, have to make some sort of decision about what I'm going to put in the bottle. And that's the toughest part of my job is saying goodbye to the wine, putting it in the bottle and knowing that what's in there is what I'm going to have to live with forever. So when I'm doing that, I always taste the same wine under a variety of different circumstances and over a pretty good length of time so that I give myself to, uh, the chance to experience it in a lot of different states of mind. All right. Um, so I'm going to start now by putting up a slideshow. And because I, th this is such a beautiful vineyard, the Pyramid Vineyard, that I really want to give you a chance. You can't be here experiencing it for yourself, but I want to give you a chance to see it and uh, get a sense of what it's like and where it's set in the countryside rather than just uh, looking at me and hearing me talk about it. So um, here we go. My uh, folks came to California, well, it came to, to Sonoma County and Chalk Hill Road in, in 1971. 
and uh, planted the ranch I grew up on in 1972. Uh, they're actually both from New York and they didn't know anything about farming, but um, my dad in particular was really captivated with Cabernet Sauvignon and he had done, had gone to farms in the West as a kid and um, actually worked on some farms in Wyoming and at the same time, strangely, had been exposed to a lot of Bordeaux. Um, and so he was dreaming about growing Cabernet. He came to California first in 1957 and he started poking around in the 60s looking for a place to plant the vineyard. And he ended up um, on Chalk Hill Road in, like I said, in 1971. And at that time, Alexander Valley um, had not even been established as an appellation and there wasn't even any Cabernet Sauvignon wine available to be drunk from it. The first plantings of Cabernet in Alexander Valley were in the late 60s. Um, but my dad and mom believed that they were going to be able to grow uh, great Cabernet here. I think largely um, because they thought the soil and the climate looked right, but also just because it was such a beautiful place um, that I think they just kind of took a leap. So we grew uh, grapes for other people for about 30 years, first on the Stone Vineyard and then Red Winery. And then in 1995, my folks bought the Pyramid Vineyard, um, which was at that time an abandoned cattle ranch all the way at the very Southern end of Alexander Valley. That's my sister Janina in that picture. And uh, at this point, she's the one I'm in business with here. Uh, that's a picture of our Pyramid Vineyard. And as you can see, it's a mountainous vineyard and a really beautiful, um, a re and in a really beautiful setting. It's all the way at the Southern end of Alexander Valley. Most of Alexander Valley is a wide open uh, plain that has been farmed off and on for about 150 years. But this vineyard, um, the Pyramid Vineyard is all the way at the Southern edge, really in the wildlands and the mountains between Chalk Hill Road and Knights Valley. And developing a pyramid was, for me, really exciting. I was, I was 20 years old at the time, and I cut firewood for a couple of seasons to open up the, some of the scrub land and some of the more farmable areas. This is what it looks like today. And, um, and it had the feeling to me, right or wrong, of doing something that was akin to what my folks did when they first came to this country because it was a part of the world where, uh, where vineyard had never even really existed. Now that's different. Now there are quite a lot of vineyards down there and that's kind of the way these things go. But uh, it's about 115 acres in total and it goes from 300 feet to about 500 feet. And out of that 115 acres, we ended up planting in the neighborhood of 24. And then the rest of it, we just left as wildland, partly because um, it just didn't, it was, it's so extreme in its geography that it didn't even really make sense to try to tackle. And partly because uh, it, uh, it was just so beautiful that it almost, it was a little bit bittersweet doing anything to it at all. Um, the soil down here, in the Chalk Hill region is really special. And, and what you saw in the background of that last slide was Mount St. Helena. And there's a soil type that is called Sonoma Volcanics that underlies um, most of the mountains in Sonoma and Napa County. And in particular in the Chalk Hill region, there's just a ton of volcanic ash and all kinds of volcanic rock like obsidian and this ranch is just completely full of that stuff and has very little topsoil. So you can imagine that it was really difficult to develop uh, a country like that. There isn't any, there wasn't a well, there isn't any, still isn't any electricity on this property. Um, and it was really, it was like, uh, it, it had the feeling of frontiering. I feel a little bit ridiculous saying that, um, but it was a different time in this county. 
And everything that made this ranch difficult um, and expensive to develop makes it difficult and expensive to farm. But those very same things are the things that make it so unique and so exciting to make wine from. Um, it's just, there is um, an intensity to the fruit off this place that I've never seen equaled on any of the other vineyards that I've made wine from. And not just ours, but other people's too. Um, it's just a spectacular site. It produces small berries, and thick skins, and amazing color year in and year out. It's super tannic. Um, and there's so much variation in terms of soil type and in terms of exposure that we could almost do the single vineyard program that we do at Hawks just off the Pyramid Vineyard. And when we're making wine from this, from Pyramid, what we typically do is harvest a, um, a bunch of little sections of blocks and, and ferment them separately, put them to barrel separately, and then taste through them and try to determine not just which ones we think are the best, but which ones we think most exemplify this ranch and the character of this ranch. And as it, again, for me, that's the character of Pyramid is all about the rugged climate that it comes from. And these wines have a rugged quality too. Um, I was really surprised when I tasted the 2013, as I've mentioned, how tannic and how lively um, and how rough it still feels to me. And I don't actually mean that in a bad way. Um, and the love of the vineyard and the respect for it informs the way we make the wines in other ways too. I love, uh, our wines spend about two years in barrel, just roughly speaking for our Cabernets. And I love French oak barrels and I can't imagine making Cabernet without them. But at the same time, for me, these wines um, are all about the places that they come from. And it's like when you're eating a delicious steak, you never want to eat it without salt, but you be, want to be pretty careful too, not to ruin it by putting too much salt. And that's the way I feel about oak. The wine wouldn't be the same without it, but at the same time, I'll be damned if I'm going to do anything to uh, cover up the essential character of the vineyard. And that's a, that goes into blending too. Um, I don't think about trying to make a perfect wine. I think about trying to make a compelling and interesting wine and trying to make a wine that has a point of view that's characteristic of something, that's trying to say something. And um, it's when you're talking about this ranch, you're talking about a place that's beautiful and compelling in and of itself. And as a winemaker, all you're trying to do is capture that. Got any questions for me, Susanna? Yeah, we've got a we've got a couple of great ones. Um, the first is um, the audience is curious if anything other than Cabernet is planted at the pyramid. Um, when we developed it, so the pyramid is twenty four acres in total, um, give or take. It's funny. I just actually we're I just actually went through and tried to calculate the size of the blocks again, but the the acreage is hard to calculate on this place. Um, partly because the blocks are, are, are so completely up and down and we, we hardly even have any rows that are the same length. But anyway, um, yeah, when we first planted, it was all Cabernet Sauvignon. And then about five years ago, I grafted over a hundred vines each to, uh, to Malbec, Petit Verdot and Cabernet Franc um, and started fooling around just making a Bordeaux blend. I hardly have any of that wine. Um, and mostly I end up drinking it myself or selling it to somebody else for their project. But um, I think Petit Verdot especially does, does really well out there too. Um, but for, to my lights, uh, there is no other varietal like Cabernet Sauvignon, especially to represent a place like this. Um, I think the tannic structure of Cabernet is just incredible. And, and um, even if I fool around with other things, I can't imagine going, going away from that. 
Carol Miller is um, she's curious. She'd like you to explain what you mean when you say that you're trying to create or express a point of view. Well, what I mean is that um, I think that a lot of modern wine suffers from the idea that um, that there's maybe a perfect a perfect example of California Cabernet out there, or a perfect example of Alexander Valley Cabernet out there. Um, I was. I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone yesterday and um, she was talking about a Cabernet tasting that she had done and how pissed off she was that she that that um, she felt like a few of the wines that she tasted were, were a misrepresentation of Alexander Valley and that they were so soft and so supple and so easygoing and so so chocolatey so so chocolate syrupy that um, that she felt like they didn't do the valley justice. And um, I feel like diversity is good in wine. And that the last thing that we wanna do is feel like we should all be making wine that points in, or we should all be going in the same direction. Um, I, for one, like tannin and I like acid and I'm not afraid to make a wine that, um, might be a little bit challenging, especially when it's young. I think that there's nothing, to me, easy drinking is not the first order of business. Riveting is the first order of business. I wanna make a wine that you go back to the glass over and over again. I hope that answers the question. And Jen is curious if you pick the Petit Verdot Melbeck um, separate from the Pyramid Cabernet fruit. Oh, of course. Yeah, those, that's a tiny amount of fruit that I'm talking about. So again, it's 100 vines. And um, I mean, so it's a couple hundred pounds of fruit a year. And yeah, it's the kind of thing that you can, um, that you can ferment in a bathtub. When I've been fooling around making wine non-professionally since I was a little kid. And um, I don't think that what I do now actually is all that different. Um, I, I did when I started out. But yeah, I ferment those separately and I will just do things like pick them and then uh, and then just uh, ferment them in a small plastic container, sometimes even in my garage. All right, so um, now we're gonna go ahead and taste the wines and talk about them um, and talk about the three vintages in particular. But um, before I do that, I want to just talk a little bit about vintage variation, and, and I and I'm sorry if I'm if I'm going over ground that I've already covered. Um, but to me, it's important to keep in mind when you're drinking wine that um, it's not a blended scotch. That what we're doing here is farming and and creating something that is meant to capture um, the spirit of the place and the time. And as we all know, having lived through uh, 2020, um, uh, not every year is the same. And um, I want to express that in our wines. And I think that it's one of the privileges of being a smaller house and having a smaller audience um, that um, my job isn't to make the same wine every year. My job is to approach this project with my whole heart and try to make the wines as good as they possibly can. And to me, that actually means that um, I try to interpret what, for example, 2010 wants to be, what it can best express, and I try to bring that to the bottle. I don't try to make 2010 like 2013 because then I think I'd make a marginal uh, version of both of them. Um, and then I also want to say that that you know, even as the person who grew the grapes for these wines, made them, and then spent years obsessing over them, to some extent, some of what makes these wines taste the way they do um, remains a mystery to me. And uh, I, I actually hate to admit that mysteries exist. I know they're romantic, but as somebody who's a craftsman, uh, they're just frustrating too. But that's just the way wine is. Uh, you don't always know the way it, why it turns out the way that it does. So um, let's talk about the 2010. I'm gonna take a little bit more if that's all right. So, um, the, the, the thing about the 2010, the first thing I'll say about the 2010 vintage is that, um, to be frank, it really surprised me with how good it was. Um, I never expected this to be a really strong vintage. Um, it, uh, was, was 
a year where in late September, there were um, unprecedented heat spikes in the last, I wanna say it was the last week of September. We had a period where it got to be 106 and stayed that way for, uh, for like three or four days running. And at that point, everybody had reduced the canopy to try to expose the grapes to sunlight and people ended up with a lot of sunburn. We ended up with sunburn had to, and had to throw a lot of stuff on the ground, a lot of, a lot of burned grapes on the ground. And then it rained. Um, and at the time, as a farmer, it felt kind of catastrophic. I hadn't lived through a vintage like that. Um, and um, I was really surprised going to the barrel and tasting these wines uh, by, how much I, by how much I like them. Um, and I'll say too that I think um, when you're a winemaker and you're making wine and it's a, in a, in, and it's a good vintage uh, or a great vintage like 2013, an easy vintage, you don't really have much of a job. When you make your money is in a vintage like 2010, when, um, when things are really difficult and you have to figure out how to, uh, how to make lemonade out of lemons. So when we picked 2010, and I'll just, I'll talk about the wine in just a moment. When we picked 2010, I just remember that I actually went into the vineyard and carved off a bunch of different sections within the blocks themselves. Sometimes they were kind of amoeba shaped. Sometimes they were triangles or trapezoids, a bunch of different sections that I, that that I, I sectioned off according to the way they tasted to me just by, uh, just, just from walking the rows. Um, so in terms of the way of what I get from the 2010 right now, I, this is one of the only wines that we've ever produced that I would describe as jammy. Um, and not very jammy, but I do think there's a component of it there. Um, I get that on the nose. Uh, it's such a, and to me, this is, it's such, it's, and it's such a beautiful and complex nose. And to me, this is a perfect example of, in fact, why you should not decant old wines. As I'm smelling this now, I smelled the bottle that I had opened from yesterday and I opened it, tasted it, corked it, and I smelled it and it smelled delicious, but it had much more of just a straightforward, beautiful black fruit aroma. I got blackberry and I got and I got currant and I got Santa Rosa plum. I always get Santa Rosa plum in this wine. That's what I got tasting a, tasting the bottle and smelling the bottle earlier today that has been open overnight. But what I get now from a freshly opened bottle is a lot more of the tertiary aromatics and the stuff that I really think is unique to old wine and makes me love it. I love the interplay in old wine between those fresh fruit components um, like blackberry, like strawberry, like, uh, like Santa Rosa plum and um, more weird exotic stuff that you're almost, when I first started drinking wine that I was surprised to even find in it at all. And in this, in the 2010, um, freshly opened, I get a lot of earth, which I didn't get in the wine when I was uh, smelling it earlier today that had been open for a while. I get leather, I get black licorice. And I also, um, I also do get the toast from the oak here. Um, and it's a little bit nerdy to say, but I do use as much as, much as I don't use lots of new barrels. Um, I still pay really a close, close attention to the cooperage that I do use more in terms of toast level than anything else. So we'll use light toast barrels, hardly ever use light toast barrels because I find that they taste like and smell like, like anise, for example, and I'm not really crazy about that. American oak barrels, I find, really smell like vanilla and I'm not wild about that in our wine. But um, the heavier toast you go, the more you tend to get into the kind of caramel flavor spectrum. And I feel like in this wine now, partly it's a function of the fruit, partly it's a function of the age, but I do get just a tiny feeling of char and a little bit of coffee. I always get coffee from the Pyramid Vineyard as well. I'll say too, I don't know. I mean, I've never, I'm trying to think, I don't think I've ever done a tasting like this. I'm, I can't tell um, whether I'm boring everybody to tears or not, but I, I feel like I should say at least a little bit about like how I taste wine and how I think maybe you ought to try to experience the wines to get an idea of where I'm coming from. And you'll see me swirling the wine. Yeah, but 
one of the things that's really neat to do too is to pour the wine in the glass and let the wine sit in the glass and then smell the wine in the glass that's been sitting there for a while without swirling it. Because one of the things about these tulip shaped glasses is that they allow oxygen into the glass, but they also perform the function of collecting uh, the aroma of the wine a little bit and concentrating it a little bit. And the more de delicate aromatics um, tend to blow off um, when you swirl the glass. So I'll smell it without swirling it and then, um, and then I'll swirl it and smell it again. For me, um, Susanna and I were talking about this earlier, um, just talking about what the wine smelled and tastes like. For me, it's so difficult to distinguish aroma and flavor. And I even go so far when I'm tasting the wine in the, in the winery and thinking about my blends, I even go so far as to taste the wine and then see how it smells to me when I taste it, swallow it, and then breathe out through my nose. What do I smell then? Um, part of that is just to make sure that I'm not, there aren't any flaws in there that I don't want to end up in the bottle. But to me, that also is part of the experience of the wine. Um, I want to say too that that in each of these three wines that I've tasted today, to a greater or lesser extent, I've tasted currant. And um, not dried currants, but fresh currants and some creme de cassis and some really, um, especially in this 2010, I really get that. I tried to come up with another kind of simpler descriptor because I don't like high flown descriptions for wine. I find it annoying, but I, but I really feel like that's what it is. Um, and I also think, particularly with the 2010, that there's, <laughs> there's some soy sauce here, which might catch you, catch you all as a little bit of a surprise. And I definitely get a, uh, a flavor and an aroma of, of, uh, of roasted meat. And that's something that people associate really a lot with Syrah. And I think that that has to do with the kind of earthy umami that Syrah is pretty much any decent Syrah really has. Um, it's less, it's, it's less uh, characteristic in Cabernet, but um, I think that's one of the gifts of, of Bordeaux wines after they've had a little bit of time to age. And I really get that here. And I'll also say <clears throat> that I was ready to taste the 2010 and tell all of you, if you got this wine in your cellar, drink it. But I find with all three of these wines, well, with the, more with the 10 and with the 13, that I think they have really a lot of life in front of them. I love the way the 2010 tastes right now, but, um, but it doesn't taste to me like it's going anywhere. It's got a lot of tannin on the finish still. It's got a fairly smooth finish, but I think there's still the presence of tannin there. And I also think that the nose is still really fruit forward and the palate is still really has a component of freshness to it and a really obvious fruit character that isn't going anywhere anytime soon. To me, the, the perfect point, the apex of an aging wine is when all the fruit or a good part of the fruit of its youth is still there and still present and still enjoyable. And it's there in interplay with these older tertiary characteristics that young wines, no matter how good they are, just can't achieve. Let's hope the same thing can be said for people. So what are we in 2021 now? Wow. Um, yeah, I'm going to say um, that this wine should still be really a pleasure to drink through 2030. No problem. All right. Any questions? Yeah, a lot, a lot of good questions, guys. Keep it up. Um, a two-part question from Scott Smith. Um, how many vines are um, planted on the 24 acres? And do you sell <laughs> any of that fruit to other producers? Oh, man. I feel like I should know the answer to that. The, the spacing on our different vineyards is different. Um, <clears throat> on Stone and on Red Winery, our other two vineyards, um, we're on what's called six by four spacing. And that means that the rows themselves are six feet wide and the vines have uh, four feet between them. And that's new. We're going through and, and replanting all of our old vineyards and we're doubling the spacing. Um, when we first started, um, there were, um, all the vineyards were planted on 12 by 12 and then my dad, no, 12 by eight. And then my dad doubled the number of rows and they were planted on 12 by six and then six by eight and now six by four. So more and more vines per row. On the pyramid, because it's so mountainous 
And because it's because it's so hard to work, uh, we're planted, the rows are another two feet apart. It's really hard when you're driving on this vineyard to uh, keep the tractor from sliding into the vines and ripping them up. So we have to give ourselves a little bit of room and you need a little bit of room to maneuver to, for, for, for the purposes of safety. There are hills on the pyramid that are like 45% grade. So, um, so because of that, we can't uh, plant it quite so tightly. I don't know how many vines are on 24 acres because I'm not that good at math, but it's a, it's a, an acre is 43,560 square feet. And we've got one vine uh, and, we've, and we're planted on six by eight spacing. So what's six times eight? Susanna? 48, I think. <laughs> so, so, so the number, so the number of vines, uh, so the number of vines on, on an acre is 43,560 divided by 48. And if I remember correctly, it's something like 1400 vines an acre ballpark. Is that right? I know that six, I know that six by four is, is over 1800 vines an acre, which in the, when I started doing this would have been, would have been thought of as crazy anyway. All right, Gary Hood is um, curious how you can tell when a grape is sunburned. <sighs> okay, so two different things happen when grapes desiccate. One is that they um, they shrivel up, and that will happen just from the grapes hanging out there too long and, and drying. What what happens when grapes get sunburned is that they you can look at them and see that they actually have a scar on them, and um, you can handle this a lot of different, you can keep grapes from getting sunburned a lot of different ways. And, um, and it's important to expose grapes, not just to warmth, red grapes, not just to warmth, but to light. Um, people talk about and care about Cabernet Sauvignon, talk about a, a major problem in Cabernet Sauvignon being greenness. And that comes from a compound called pyrazine. This isn't crazy. Pyrazine, I mean, it's, this isn't crazy technical. Pyrazine is just is a green flavor, and it's a green. It's the green flavor that's in string beans, and it's the green flavor that's in bell pepper, and it's the and it's the green flavor that is in unripe uh, cabernet. Pyrazines break down over the course of the of the grape maturing, but they don't break down just as a as a function of exposure to heat. They break down as a function of exposure to light. So one of the things that we do is we try to thin the canopy to expose the grapes to light as early in the season as possible. It has a risk because as soon as you take off that canopy, the grapes are exposed to more sunlight and they can burn. They can burn then or they can burn later in the season. It has the benefit of breaking down pyrazines and making and getting rid of the green flavor in, in, in Cabernet that we really don't want. And also grapes get, as they get exposed to sunlight, get more used to it and are less apt to burn. When you have sunburn in grapes, it's a result of the temperature being 80 one day and being 105 the next. And it makes a little scar on them. And um, then they turn, then they shrivel up. All right. Will your dog be making a cameo and when will he get his own label? <laughs> I, I, I made my dog, I would love to have my dog just host the whole tasting. And I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure a lot of y'all would too, but. Um, he won't, he'll sit on my lap, but not for very long. I don't know if he's around here someplace. Maybe, I'll see, see if I can find him. Um, and no, he's not gonna get his own label. I once I've made a handful of other labels in my life and I wanted to make a label once called Black Dog, but um, it's a, cause it's a great song. But uh, my dad said, you can't make wine and call it a dog. You mentioned during the slideshow that you don't strive to make perfect wines, but, but wines that are more interesting. Among these three vintages, what did you do to each to try and give them additional character? I know you love the 2014 vintage, but among these three, what did you have to change? I don't, I, yeah, I don't change things. I really don't aim to change things. Um, and, um, you know, um, yeah, no, I don't aim to change things in, in winemaking at all. It's not like I take offense at the question, um, but I, yeah, I don't do that. I really try to, um, I try to, to understand what the vintage wants to, uh, wants to express, is expressing, and I try to, um, to express that in a positive way. Um, I, it's true that every vintage has flaws, but I think that, I think 
that when we're thinking about wine and when we're appreciating wine, we're doing that because we love it. And I think that the, that the right way to be looking about at, at wine and, and thinking about wine is to think about the things in it that we love and fostering the things in it that we love rather than thinking about the things um, about it that we think are flawed or could be better and doing everything we can in the making of it to, to drum those things out. Um, so I have more, let's say I have a problem with bitterness in a wine. And a lot of the time I do, it has, it's partly a function of how I make it, but sometimes, and I'm pretty sensitive to bitter, but I don't have a tendency to want to find out bitterness in wine um, most of the time because I'm worried about what it's going to do to the other stuff in the wine that I love. Um, I wouldn't find out bitterness if I thought I was risking uh, finding out um, brightness, for example, or, or freshness or some beautiful fruit character that I feel like is a gift uh, to have in the first place. So, I mean, that's just my approach. Um, I've found that if, if, you're, if you're hanging out with wine professionals and drinking wine, all we wanna think about and talk about is what's wrong with it instead of what's right with it. And uh, I think that's a mistake. Um, all right, so where are we? The 2013. Um, the last person who asked a question was mentioning how much I love the 2014, and I really do love the 2014, but um, I love the 2013 too. What Robert Parker said about the 14 was, its only fault was that it came on the heels of 2013. 2013, as a vintage for California, Cabernet is probably the most universally lauded vintage of my lifetime. Actually, let me probably easily the most uh, the most universally lauded vintage of my lifetime. Um, really, uh, really an incredible uh, vintage, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that this vintage fell in the heart of a historic drought here in uh, in California. A little bit later, we're going to look at a slide that compares just a couple of different data points um, from these three different vintages. And one of those is rainfall. And in 2010, it rained something like 28 inches. In 2013, it rained something like 40 inches, 40 odd inches. And in 2013, it rained eight and change. The average rainfall in Sonoma County is, is about 40 inches. And, and again, it rained about eight inches in 2013. A lot of that after, uh, after the grapes had already been harvested. 12 was dry, 13 was dry, 14 was dry. So we were in the middle of the drought. Um, and what that, while 2013 was a, was a drought year, it wasn't actually a spectacularly hot year. It was warm, but it was a warm and fairly mild summer and then a warm, dry fall. And we were able to just let the fruit um, stay out through the fall, into the fall, and really just decide when, decide when we wanted to, uh, to harvest and go ahead and do it. That's not the way it usually works with Cabernet. Usually with Cabernet, you're, uh, you're harvesting because you're worried that the grapes are gonna get rained on if you don't. So 2013 was much more uh, a tiptoeing through the tulips kind of harvest scenario. Um, now, I remember in making the 13 that one of my concerns was that it was going to be out of balance as a wine because I felt like it had such spectacular, um, extravagant aroma and, and flavor that I was worried that when I tasted it at this age that it was, it was going to be um, a little bit on the flaccid side. And um, I was really surprised, as I was surprised by the 2010 and how lively it was, I'm even more surprised by that in the 2013. I think this wine is, honestly, it's overly acidic when you first open it and it needs time to breathe and time to open. So if you were dumb enough to open all three of these bottles um, tonight or smart enough, depending on how you look at it, um, you could just put a cork in the 2013 and leave it till tomorrow and it would probably taste better than it will tonight. Um, it's a wine that I think really does benefit from air. Um, it's just got incredible tannic intensity, which bodes really well for, um, for, the, for, its for the life in front of it. 
And it's interesting too that both in the aroma and in the flavor of this wine, I get a lot of non-fruit aromatics, a lot of the kind of stuff that I was talking about in the 2010. Um, I, get, I get coffee on the nose. I get a little of that same, um, that same roasted meat that we talked about in the 2010. I think that's, um, that's pretty typical of the pyramid. And uh, I even get a tiny bit of pine. Um, I can't think of another. I can't think of another word for that. I I look. I you know. I smelled it over and over again yesterday and today. And and I do. I get a tiny bit of pine. I've said mint before in Cabernet. I've never said pine. But well, there you go. And that's on top of um, of the blue fruit that this uh, vineyard always has: um, blackberries and and blueberries and um, yeah, mm, a little black cherry. Ah, uh, yeah, I don't know. That's really tasting delicious to me. Um, the, yeah, still, I would venture to guess that most of the Cabernet you taste out there in the world, that is a 2018, tastes less tightly wound than this 2013 does right now. But it has such beautiful, uh, flavor beyond that tannic grip and that acidity. Um, I always get Santa Rosa Plum, as I've said, in these wines. Um, I get um, I get some baking chocolate. Mm. Yeah, delicious. Um, and I said about the 2013. I mentioned earlier that I thought that. Um, that I, that I was surprised by how lively it is. And that's then that I think it's got a really long life in front of it. And one of the, one of the favorite Hawks Wine Club members of all time, uh, George Shaughnessarian, uh, passed away this last year. And um, here's to you, George. And um, I looked at an email that I had written to George about the 2013 Cabernet. And I said in the email, um, I think I, I was kind of being facetious, but I said, I think it'll reach its peak somewhere around uh, 2037. And smelling and tasting this wine now, um, I actually, I think that that's totally reasonable. Um, to me, I like old wine. And to me, um, I will like this, the way this wine is drinking in 10 years better than I like the way it's drinking now. Um, no problem. So while you could drink the 2010 and 10 years from now, and I think it'd still have integrity, that's not to say that I think it will be better than it is today. But the 2013, I actually think it will improve um, into the mid, into the 2030s. I think it'll continue to improve. Um, and a word about old wine. One of my favorite quotes is from a guy that I worked with making wine early in my career. And he said, good wine is always good. And what he meant by that is, it's good when it's grapes. It's good when it's fermenting. It's good when it just finished fermenting. It's good in the barrel. It's good right after it goes in the bottle. And it's good years after it goes in the bottle. So I don't think we should ever, as consumers, as, as appreciators of wine, I don't think we should ever fall into the trap of thinking, this wine is incomprehensible to me and it seems like it sucks. And somebody says, oh, well, that's just because it hasn't reached its full maturity yet. You just wait and it's really going you know, to uh, blow your doors off. Well, no, I don't think so. Every great wine that I have ever tasted was great at every part of, of its evolution. It doesn't necessarily mean it's at its best, but still greatness is in there. And I think, and I think uh, you get it when you're tasting a great wine. All right, so any questions, Susanna? Yeah, so a few different questions about um, sugar levels, bricks. Um, okay. How high of a sugar level do you aim for? And is it more or less than other producers? And what is the effect of a higher or lower level? Okay, um, if there's a lot, you know, I've sold grapes to, I don't know, 50 different wineries over the years. They didn't used to say that they picked on flavor. They used to actually just admit that they were picking on bricks. Now, now they all say that they pick on flavor and they pretty much all pick on bricks anyway. They pretty much all pick on sugar level. Um, so what I like to do is I like to correlate what the numbers, what the laboratory numbers say with my taste. 
Um, if I go out there and I taste the Cabernet and it's 22 bricks and I think, wow, this stuff tastes great, I will not go out and pick it. I have enough experience to know that I'm not going to like Cabernet that's made um, from grapes that are 22 bricks. If I get into the 23.5 range, 23 and a half range with Cabernet, for me, I know, okay, I'm in the period where if I go out and I taste these grapes and they're tasting really good to me, that I should be thinking about the possibility of picking them. Are they getting any better? And um, 2013 is a great example of this because in 2013, the weather, it was dry and it was mild. And so you had the chance, which you hardly ever do, of going out and tasting the grapes on a daily basis and deciding whether or not you think they're better than they were the day before. And when they stop being better than they were the day before, then you pick them. A lot of the time, you're going out and tasting the grapes and you're saying, okay, it's Tuesday and today it's 80 degrees. And then for the next two days, it's gonna be 102. And then on Friday, it's gonna rain. Um, so that means that, that what's going to happen to the grapes in the next couple of days or in the next week after the time that you're tasting them informs your decisions around picking. Um, I tend to harvest at lower bricks than most people. And I think that that's reflected in the wine. Um, these wines are, uh, are brighter and, um, and fresher and more tannic than almost anybody else's wines. They also, I don't find them um, and I don't use a lot of new oak. So um, all that is to try to bring something um, something direct, as, direct as, as direct as possible to the glass. Um, and I think that if you let grapes get overripe, that while they, while they might make a smoother, easier to drink wine, they make wine that has less character. All right, in your opinion, Cabernet with, <clears throat> it with food, it must or drink solo? Good question. Um, I think it depends on the Cabernet. And I actually think that the 2010 and the 2013 are a great uh, juxtaposition. The 10, to me, um, a grilled ribeye makes everything better. Um, and certainly that's true of the 2010. It would love to be uh, enjoyed next to um, a grilled portobello or a grilled piece of steak. But at the same time, I think because of its maturity and because of the softness that it has, you can drink it by itself. And um, you can drink it with a great conversation and, um, and, that's a, and that's a perfect pairing. I think the 2013, where it is right now, really demands the company of, of food. And I would say um, really rich food. Um, the, the acid and the tannin in it, um, I mean, just the simple physical stuff that's happening in your mouth, the texture of this wine, its composition would really benefit from the presence of a little bit of fat on your tongue. That could come in the form of uh, bolognese um, or, um, or a steak um, or yeah, um, even, uh, even burrata and, uh, and acid, beautiful acid tomatoes and olive oil, but something to coat your tongue a little bit when you're drinking a wine that's this acid and this tannic. You mentioned the 2010 <clears throat> can still spend some time in the cellar. I have a Magnum signed by my wedding guest that we were planning to open in 2025. Do you think it will still be showing well then or should we open sooner? Absolutely. Um, save it till 2025, but drink it in 2025. I think um, if I had to say one thing about wine that would apply to every wine in everybody's cellar, yeah, and if that was either drink or hold, it would be drink. Um, too much of the time we get, our wine is expensive. There's more expensive wine out there, but I think our wine's expensive. And I think one of the things that we, that we wanna do with wines that we prize is keep them around because we're afraid that maybe the moment isn't exactly right. And to some extent, and to some extent as much as we look, we look forward to enjoying them, we also hate the idea of saying goodbye, um, but you gotta do it. Wine is made to be drunk. So um, if you're gonna drink it in 2025, um, great, no problem, drink it in 2025, but don't, just don't wait till 2040. 
A lot of questions about how you got into writing and um, where your influence um, for the club letters comes from. I got into writing because I'm dyslexic and I spent my entire young life not being able to read. And uh, I learned to read as an adult. And uh, I really, it, it had, was something that had terrorized me my whole life, the written word. And at the same time, I loved people and the way they talk and I love stories. And I wanted to uh, have it be something that I was comfortable in and could enjoy instead of something that I was afraid of. So I decided I would figure out how to write. All right, so let's talk about the 2016s. And when I do this, um, I'm actually gonna put up a, another slide and I got, I got a whole bunch of different data together to, and I had to restrain myself at the advice of uh, my handlers from uh, displaying all this data and, and having this whole uh, presentation be about data. But I, but I can't resist. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. I, I can't resist um, doing at least a little bit of that, just because I think it's really informative. Um, so what we're going to look at right now is a slide that shows um, a couple of different, a handful of data points across these three vintages that um, that we're tasting right now. So we got that up. Okay. So um, as I mentioned. I talked about rainfall before. And one of the things that, um, that Susanna talked me out of doing, and I think she was right, is trying to explain the concept of a degree day. Um, so I'm not gonna do that. But what I will say is that, um, <laughs> what I will say is that it's a, that it, that it's a measure, it's a heat index. And um, it's a measure of accumulated heat over the course of a season. And within every zone in California and the world for that matter, there are different, um, it's, the world is divided into different zones that experience different, different heat indexes and different amounts of accumulated heat over the course of a season. And um, it's very interesting to look at the, at the difference in degree days over the course of the three different vintages that we're drinking. If you look at um, the 2010 vintage, you'll see that there are about 3,500 degree days there that where it says degree day accumulation it says 3521 and then in 2013 4021 and then in 2016 4497 and to give you an idea of how unprecedented the heat of 2000 or the, the accumulated heat of 2016 was I'll tell you that we're in what's called region 3 um, and region 3 includes Napa and Sonoma and the Rhone. Pretty freaking warm um, is region three. It's a good place to grow Cabernet. It's a good place to grow Syrah, et cetera. The, 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 the typical degree day range in Napa and Sonoma um, and the Rhone is, uh, is 3,000 to 3,500 uh, degree days. So what that means is that 2010 is at the high end of the normal spectrum for a degree day accumulation, which puts 2013 incredibly hot and 2016 just ridiculously hot. Um, and okay, so there's that. Um, let me know when that slide's still up or if it's down, is it still up? Okay, so one of the things that I meant to mention earlier in terms of, of tasting wine and how I taste wine and what I think about when I'm tasting wine is I, Part of what we're trying to do as winemakers is understand why a vintage is the way it is, um, what makes it the way it is. Because obviously, as a farmer and as a winemaker, um, you want to keep the things that you think you did right and change the things that you think you did differently. Um, but part of the problem with that is that I think you tend to bring a certain set of, 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 of preconceptions to a tasting. You think that because the 2010 got rained on, that um, there's going to be that that will that that somehow it will have been irreparably damaged, um, and you can. I've seen so many winemakers fall victim to this. You can allow those preconceptions, both in what you're seeing in the vineyard before you make wine from it, or just in what has happened in the weather in general. You can allow those preconceptions to really shape your experience of the wine that, that is actually in front of you once you've made it. 
And I think it's essential that you actually, to being a great winemaker, a good winemaker, it, to really making wine, I think it is essential to put those preconceptions behind you once you have made the wine and try to taste it for what it is. And so with that, what I'll say is 2016 to me has an amazing freshness. Um, I think it's the defining characteristic of, of this wine. Um, and I was turned on to the idea of freshness in Cabernet kind of coming on the heels of those drought vintages. So 12, and 13, and 14 were really thought of as ideal vintages. 12 was a great vintage before 13. And they were thought of as ideal vintages because they were such long, dry falls and mild falls. But one of the things that I noticed with our lots of wine that, that I made that I liked less well from those vintages was that they had a certain exhausted quality. Like I felt like they didn't have the fruit, they, there wasn't a lot of freshness to them. They didn't smell or taste or feel very much like fresh fruit. And so going into 15, which was a which was comparable to 16 anyway, going into the following vintages, I had in mind that I really didn't want to go, I really didn't want to let that happen again. That while I loved the 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 very developed character of the 13, the 12, the 13, and the 14. I wanted to make sure that I also captured a certain freshness in the wine. Um, and I feel like we really did that in 2016. The question is, when it was so hot, how? And I think that the reason I showed you this, this the, the slide is, I think that, that some of that is in the other less obvious data. Bud break in 2016 was in late February, which is the earliest I can ever remember it being. It was ridiculously early, dangerously early. Um, things could have, vines are timed to, to break dormancy after the major danger of, of frost has passed. And in the case of 2016, I mean, they didn't break dormancy in the middle of winter, but they broke dormancy in what I typically think of as winter. And what that means is that the growing season started that much earlier than it usually does. Everything was accelerated. And we ended up harvesting um, at the end of September. My dad always said about Cabernet, um, he always said when I was sweating because it was September and, and I couldn't believe that the grapes were gonna get ripe and I was dying to pick things. He always said October is the month of Cabernet. Um, and what he meant by that is that it is typical of Cabernet to wait to get ripe until October. That's typical, you shouldn't be surprised by it. And that's right. In the case of 2016, we could have left those grapes into October. And I think if we had left those grapes into October, we would have lost the freshness that we, um, that we attained. Um, so early bud break, early hot summer, early harvest. Um, so super hot vintage, but at the same time, I think that pulling the trigger fast on the harvest ended up, ended up meaning that we were left with a fairly fresh wine. And one of the things that you get there to me that, that these other two wines don't have is um, an aroma of violets. And I've gotten that on a couple of our Merlots and thinking about our past Merlots, I think our 2017 Merlot, which is always from our red winery vineyard. I think it really smelled like violets. I think our 18 Merlots smelled like violets. And you very seldom, we very seldom get that in Cabernet. And especially from the vineyard like the pyramid, which really tends to be more about this kind of big muscular um, full fruit. So I love the, the floral aromatics in this wine. And there are other little herbaceous components in here. I mean, to be sure, there's the same Santa Rosa plum that I always get and that I love. Um, but I also get a little thyme and a little mint. And I think for me, um, I think a little bit of herbaceousness, a little bit of dried herbs is, um, I think that's typical of Cabernet. And I think a lot of the time people tend to get Cabernet ripe enough that they manage to drum out um, that slightly herbaceous character that it has. And I think that's a mistake. I think it's one of the things that actually makes um, Cabernet so enchanting. Um, yeah. A tiny bit of that soy sauce that that uh, that I got in the two thousand in in both the other two vintages. Mm. Yeah, and uh, 
This wine to me too, the 2016 also doesn't have the tannic grip of the 2013. It doesn't have the lushness of the 2010, but to me, it is so even all the way across the palate. Um, I love the way it enters. It's got a tiny, it feels like a tiny bit of kind of like uh, salty, sweet, tangy at the beginning. And then it's just so even and so kind of mid high tone all the way across. Um, really, even though it's young, that balance to me is what makes it so drinkable. I think this wine is much more approachable now than 2013. I think it's got years to age, but at the same time, I remember thinking about it like a year ago that it was remarkably approachable. Like, and hard to say, hard to say, but it's not angular. My dad also has always talked about turned me on to the idea of a, um, a salty, savory dimension in wine. And sometimes savory, when people say savory, I think a lot of the time what they're talking about is the kind of earthy, meaty quality, but salt is another thing. And I think that this wine, I love trying to achieve that in our wines because I just don't understand where it comes from and I love it. And I think it, it really serves the purpose of balancing out rich fruit so well. Um, and I think that, that the 2016 really obviously has that. Um, it's got almost like a salted caramel thing happening for me in the, in, in the flavor and in the aroma. Um, and I really see bright things for the future of this wine. Um, it will never be the kind of giant blockbuster that the 2013 is, but I think it just rides this incredible balance and drinkability and it'll, and it'll continue to do that. Um, yeah, another another 10 years, um, easy. So figure that you're going to be finishing your 2010s by 2030. Figure that you're gonna be in the heart of the 2013s and same with the 2016. Mm, delicious. Any questions, Susanna? Yeah, um, first up is from Frank Simmons. He has a question about the corks. Um, so you change corks between the 10, 13, and 16. Yep. How do the different types of cork affect the wine? Oh, oh, Frank. Um, I don't know. That's a tough question. I wish I could answer that. Um, the, the, the cork that we're using now is, is it's a, it's called a Diom and it's a, and it's a natural cork that is completely free of voids. And one of the things about it, and that is not true, as you can see, if you look at the corks of previous vintages, you can see that they got some holes in them. Some are better than others, um, but natural cork all tends to have holes in it. The, the, the 2016 is a, is a Dion cork, and it's a process that they came up with where they were able to eliminate any of the voids, any of the air spaces in the that, that exist in natural cork. The thing that I worry about natural cork, and I think I can't imagine making up a, a bottle of, of serious wine without a cork in it. But the thing that I worry about historically with cork and that I worried about in the 10 and the 13, why I made the change, the thing I worry about is cork taint, TCA. And cork taint gets into the voids in the cork and that's what ends up spoiling the wine. And these wines and why you want to worry about that are a perfect example of a perfect example of why to be concerned about it. It doesn't bother me if one of my customers um, gets, I mean, I don't like it, but if one of my customers gets a current release bottle of Alexander Valley Cabernet and it has a bad cork and they bring it back and say, this wine has a bad cork, or they used to, now, now our wines just don't have bad corks anymore, which is kind of magic. That's okay. But when you have a 2010 and you get it in the mail and you're going to, let's say, tune into virtual tasting and um, it has a bad cork, that's just a disaster. So I changed in 2016 because I wanted to go away from that and go into something like this that um, is impervious to TCA. All right, Vic Miles. Hi, Vic. Um, he is curious if they should also be aging the Alexander Valley Cab um, or storing the single vineyard uh, Cabernets longer. I don't know, that's a tough question. Um, I don't, 
Yeah, that's a tough question. I think that that's, that's vintage to vintage. Um, and I think it also really depends on who you are and how you like the wines. There is no right answer that fits everybody in terms of, um, of how they should drink wine. I used to, I started out making wine by pulling barrel samples and putting them in bottles and taking them over to my mom and dad's house and sitting at the kitchen table and drinking through the barrel samples and making notes on them and playing with blends and arguing about things. And at the end, so we would be doing that with wines that were three months old and six months old and a year old, the same wines that we're tasting today in that state, you know, so we did that with the 2010, 2013 for sure. And then at the end of doing that, the end of a, of a tasting session like that, I'd be ready to go home and drink something else. And my dad would keep the barrel samples and drink them with dinner. You know, super tannic wines. Um, I don't think he was missing out on anything I, I, at all by not letting those wines age. I mean, obviously he was going to be able to taste them later, but he was never as compelled by older wines as he was by younger wines, just the way he was, just the way he is. So um, just taste the wines. If you have the luxury of having more than one of these bottles in your cellar, don't go five years without ever opening it. Um, monitor it as you go, if you possibly can. And don't be afraid. If you open a bottle of this wine and you love it, don't be afraid to open the other bottles you've got and drink it too. There's nothing wrong with enjoying the wine uh, when it's young. There have been a lot of questions about the fires, um, if we were impacted, if smoke taint has been an issue, and if we're changing anything about harvest and or our winemaking in anticipation of more disasters. <laughs> um, no, I don't change things in anticipation of disaster. That's one of the things that's wrong with me, it's got, but it's gotten me where I am today. Uh, yeah, we were impacted by the fires. This ranch was burned in 2019. So... Most of the vineyard didn't burn. Vineyards don't really burn unless they have high weeds. Um, so, and it didn't, so it singed the vineyard a little bit and it burned most of the rest of the ranch. And obviously um, that was not ranch. Uh, but no, where winemaking is concerned, where winemaking and smoke taint and disaster is concerned, no, I don't have any plans to change my winemaking. Um, you know, one of the things that makers of Cabernet in California have always done wrong, as somebody who has supplied them grapes, one of the things that they have always done wrong is fail to pull the trigger, fail to pick the grapes and make wine from them. I don't know what it is. I think part of it is that people are afraid to make a decision. Um, I think part of it is that there's this natural tendency to hope that things will get better and that maybe if they pick the grapes today, they'll be missing out on the opportunity of how wonderful they could be in a week from now. And that's true, but um, at the same time, um, not picking um, whether it's in 2010 or in 2020, not picking is a decision, the same way picking is a decision. And um, as I always say about what I do, I don't get paid to make good decisions. I get paid to make decisions. So um, I'll, I, I, as long as I'm not afraid to do that, um, I think that I can go out and taste the grapes and look at the sky and decide whether or not it's time to pick them. And after that, um, it's just between me and, and what's in the tank. A lot of people are curious if you have future aspirations of baking a, a Bordeaux blend with the other varietals planted. You know, um, the short answer is yes. Um, I'm pretty busy. Um, I've kind of been meaning to do that forever and I've even gone so far as, as to make a barrel of that wine off and on over the years. Um, but um, I got a pretty full plate, I think 20, think 2025. And Lauren, Andy are curious how you decided on these three vintages. Um, I think, well, I think that these are, I didn't get into this as much as I might've, but I think these three vintages are all that I know that they're all very critically acclaimed, which I think is interesting. And um, I think they're all excellent. And they're so different, both in the way that they taste to me now. I think it's very, I think they make a very interesting juxtaposition. And I think at the same time, there's this obvious through line that represents the vineyard in the three of them. Um, and I also think that as growing seasons, the three of them are so incredibly different. It's so, so to me, 
Um, drinking a wine is one thing. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I love comparative tastings. Even when I'm drinking for pleasure, I love comparative tastings. And I just think that the three of these wines made a really interesting comparison. Um, I think one of the things that I, if I could, you know, try to leave one thing that people have made wine for for years, um, it would be, there are a lot of different ways that a wine can be good. And I think that these three vintages show that. And how do you compare the Pyramid Cabernet to your other Cabernets? Well, um, Susanna, what's your favorite vineyard? It's really hard. Maybe, maybe Red Winery. Yeah, so I think, I thought I, I thought I knew that, which is why I asked. So, you know, um, Pyramid is always the darkest of the three wines that we make. And that makes winemakers love it. And um, I like that, but I've learned over the years that it doesn't necessarily mean, darker is not necessarily better. I mean, we've made amazing wines from Rare Winery Road and it really is the other end of the spectrum. I'm lucky because I'm making wine from three different vineyards. Um, they, as a farmer, it's really difficult to farm these three different vineyards, but three different vineyards separated by about eight miles, and they really each have their own personality. There are different soils and different microclimates, and the wines are very different. The grapes are very different. The wines are very different come from each of the three of them. So um, Pyramid, is, as I have written, is a winemaker's darling of a vineyard, for sure, just because it's so spectacularly beautiful and because um, everybody wants to make Cabernet that looks like this and that is this tannic. So there's that. It's the, it's the most purple and the most tannic and maybe the most beautiful of the three, although I don't know, they're all pretty nice. What made you just decide to get into and stay in the family wine business? I didn't stay in the family wine business. I started the family wine business with my parents. I grew up um, in a farming family and I love farming. Um, but seeing the way my parents suffered when I was a kid from the um, economic realities of farming, I never would have come back here just to be a farmer. Um, it's not that I particularly wanted to make wine, although I guess I did. I did. I'm being, I'm being a little facetious, but um, it was more that um, I really love this place. I really love these vineyards. I really love working the vineyards. And I wanted to do something that I felt like um, expressed the personality of the vineyards and did and, and, and honored this, the place that I came from. That's why I wanted to make wine. And um, yeah. Did I surprise you because I stopped talking too soon? No, I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> Any um, other questions? Should we should we take a poll to see what folks' favorite okay, sure, yeah. are? Okay. Yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna take a poll now to see uh, which of these three wines y'all prefer, and then I'll let you know who won. Licorice. I forgot to say that. Uh, 2020 seems like far. Yeah, I can totally understand why you all at home would not necessarily want to open all three bottles of this wine in one night, but um, I'll just say that back in the day when we first started this business, um, we had, there was a period when we had all three single vineyards open in the tasting room at all times, and the tasting consisted of uh, a side-by-side -side of the Alexander Valley and the three single vineyards, and I do love a comparative tasting. Really nice. Well, do you want to... Do you want to announce your favorite before? I always, it's funny. I always, <laughs> I always hedge or I shouldn't say that I always hedge. I really, I really don't think of, I don't tend to have a favorite. 
I'll say which my favorite is, but before then I'll, I'll irritate everybody with a little bit more um, unsolicited philosophy. I, I really do think of these wines as, you know, when I'm making the red winery and the stone and the pyramid, um, I really do think of how well we did in each case of capturing what we wanted to capture in that vineyard. So if the pyramid to me is better in a given year than the red winery, it's because I think we did a better job of representing it than we did of the red winery. Um, and in terms of vintages, what I really look for is, did we do something good in that vintage um, that, to represent the vineyard? Okay. Um, I was gonna, earlier today, I would have said the 2016, now I'm gonna say the 2013. Um, I just, uh, yeah, hey. uh, I think it, it's just, yeah, amazing combination of uh, fruit and structure. Well, I think the, I think the audience agrees. So 52% uh, preferred the 2013, uh, 23 percent chose the 2010 and um, oh no it's just it's, people are still voting actually yeah I love the 16 and I was tempted to say that um, tempted to choose the 16 but to me again it's different for me day to day um, moment to moment but to me the 2013 this freshly opened bottle of 2013 is showing me more available fruit um, than uh, than it did when I tasted it yesterday yeah, so first place is the 2013, um, 20, 2016, and then followed by the 2010. Are you surprised? I am surprised. Yeah, I, I thought that I, I think that the 2013 is, um, I'm surprised and I'm present and I'm pleasantly surprised. One of the things that I always have to keep in mind when I'm making wine is you know, you can't make it as tannic and acidic as you would like to, otherwise nobody will drink it at all. So I was afraid that when people were tasting the 2013 today that they would be um, disappointed by, by how foreboding it is, but I guess that's not, that isn't what happened. So that's great. Um, all right. So I think that concludes the, uh, the formal presentation for this evening. And I thought we might all just kind of chat and say hello for for a couple of minutes before we sign off.